Hello, everyone. Today, we're going to be speaking with Diana Merriam, and this is the founder of the Economy Conference. And today, we're going to be talking about myths and misconceptions about the financial independence movement. Who is this for? Who is this not for? Everybody seems to have an opinion on it, and the loudest voices seem to be the ones that are the most confused. So we thought we could try to set the record straight on the ultimate crowdsource personal finance show. This is Choose FI. All right, guys, excited to dive into this week's episode and really talk about this because you always see a flamethrower going out the door saying, I walked away. This wasn't for me or what well, 10 reasons I love it. It's just, and it's just, it just seems like there's a straw man that's been created on the left and the right. And, and, uh, Diana and JD Roth both have, uh, put a lot of work into kind of thinking this through and put some great content out into the universe. And while JD Roth, Roth is not on the show, it seems like his inspiration for this amazing article that we'll link to was Diana Merriam's presentation, and we thought we could bring her on and have her kind of unpack it for us. And to help me with this, I have my co-host Brad here with me today. How you doing, buddy? Hey, Jonathan, I am doing quite well. Yeah, the uh, the great unpack scandal of 2017. That's what <laughs> we hearken back to here on Choose the Five when we use the word unpack maybe a few too many times. But anyway, more pressingly here, as you said, the loudest voices are often the most confused, right? Isn't that, isn't that so true? That's, that's interesting. And you're right. That is especially applicable when it comes to the financial independence movement, right? What is it? Who is this for? I think this is going to be a fascinating conversation and it'll be great to catch up with Diana because the last we heard from her way back on episode 150 was she was planning a conference and she didn't know how it was going to go. It was a big risk for her, right? And yeah, I mean, it should be fantastic to get an update, see what she's, what's going on in her world. And uh, with that, Diana, welcome back to Choose a Five. Well, thanks so much. Happy to be here. All right, Dan and Diana, now I know a lot has actually happened in your personal life and in the Economy Conference's life over the last year. And I can guarantee you if, if we're recording this in uh, the year 20, what, 2019, if we're recording this in fall of 2019 and you're prepping to launch your first conference, in the year, the spring of 2020, <laughs> <laughs> what could go wrong? <laughs> Hindsight 2020 would probably have scared you out of this. Yet having said that, you went for it. You didn't know what was coming. And give us a little sense. How did the first year, the economy conference, which I think you had planned for the very beginning of March, how did that, how yes. did it go? What was the, what was the feedback? Wow. Well, first of all, I feel like I dodged a bullet. I mean, who could have anticipated a global pandemic as like one of the risks to uh, planning a large scale event? So yeah, did not see that coming at all. Um, we did the event March 7th. So first weekend in March, if it would have been one week later, it would have needed to be canceled because we did it at the University of Cincinnati and they shut down the whole university. So I really feel like I dodged a bullet. A lot of people are telling me that this is the last thing that they were able to attend before everything shut down, that it's the last time they were able to travel. And it was an incredible weekend. Uh, we had 250 people. We had nine expert speakers um, at the survey after the event you know, 90% of the audience said that they loved it and that they would, you know, recommend it to a friend. So that was just really gratifying to me because I know, you know, I put 20 months of work into developing this and, you know, I would have been really devastated if I had to cancel it. But seeing that it went so well um, really makes me very excited to do it again. Okay. Well, we'll talk more about uh, economy 2021, I would imagine here, but we're, we're thrilled that you were able to pull it off and that it was such a success. Thank you. Yeah, and that certainly is one of the things I think all of us have missed, right? In the past, the past twelve plus months here is is getting together as a community. I think we've worked so hard to make this truly a financial independence community, right? We have our Choose of High local groups in three hundred plus cities. There, the Chautauquas, there's Camp Five, FinCon, Economy, obviously, right? Like all of these things are really important, and it's just it's so nice to hear about a successful past past conference and to think longingly about the future. So this is making me excited personally. And I think that's actually to your point, Brad, that really sets us up nicely because there is almost a cadence to the type of events that we traditionally have had to look forward to. And this community does look forward to these events. And because there is, you know, Hey, money nerds from all across the, all across the globe, all walks of life, looking forward to getting the opportunity to share some time together, some strategies, some tactics, you know, just having this community in person, even though maybe we met we met online, um, that has probably to some degree 
had individuals label this as a cult. You Did you join a cult? Did you go off for the weekend and join a cult? And I think that cult Kool-Aid is to some degree what this, uh, this episode will end up being about in that we're going to be talking about some of these misconceptions about the financial independence movement. So, Diana, since I know that you've given some extensive talks on this, I thought I would just hand this back to you and let you tee it up. Why did you feel the need to address this specifically in the format that you did? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, a lot of us, when we first discover this kind of content and we start getting our financial houses in order, it's really exciting and we want to share it with people. We want to tell people about it. And I think many of us are met with that kind of disbelief or people disregarding us. You know, I've had people tell me that my 60% savings rate is so unachievable that it's actually offensive to talk about it. And in my world, I'm thinking, well, if someone like Mr. Money Mustache never talked about it, I would have never found it. So to me, I want to talk about it, not to try to convince anyone that this, you know, is for them, but more so to make it accessible so that the people who this already resonates with without much convincing can, can kind of find out about it and, and learn and grow on their own. So that's, what's always kind of motivated me. And I find that you know, a lot of people will have preconceived notions or assumptions about what it is that immediately make them dismissive. You know, well, the reason you're able to save 60% is because you make a very high income or you don't have kids. I could never do that. Right. And so they're immediately dismissive of the idea without ever really digging into how I'm able to do what I'm able to do with my finances. So I think that's kind of the inspiration about around that. Maybe just trying to put some more content out there to help people understand that there are no hard, fast rules to the fire movement, that it's to me, it's more of a, a way of thinking about money. I, I like to think of it as financial literacy on steroids. You know, it's a, it's a mindset and it's taking kind of very general, well-known money practices, like live below your means. There's nothing, Let's there's nothing like revolutionary, <laughs> right? There's nothing revolutionary around that live below your means. But when you have kind of an, a cult like enthusiasm around an idea and a group of people that gather around an idea like that, it, it can seem a little weird to people that aren't familiar with it. Yeah. And I love how you said, basically we're, we're normalizing the conversation right? We're making this from, oh, this is for them, whoever that elusive them or they is, right? This could never be for me. And I think a lot of people, a lot of people do write this off because, oh, it, you have to be extreme or, oh, you have to be, you know, the old caricature, right? When the, the FI movement started was you have to be a white male in your thirties in a tech career, right? right? And that's, that caricature seems laughable right now to so many of us, especially here at Choose of I, when we look at our local groups and our, our Facebook group and see well more than 50% of the members are women. When mm -hmm. I send out my Choose of I weekly email every week and I ask for people to respond, I think I get 90% women mm -hmm. writing back to me saying, this is the action I took today. So yeah, yeah I find that just just such a laughable misconception at this point that it's, yeah. it's for any certain demographic. Right. Well, financial literacy is for everyone. Fire is almost just a brand of it. And I think this brand of financial literacy just comes with like an aggressiveness and enthusiasm that can be a little striking to people. So like, for example, I'm sure probably the top two assumptions that I hear are that it's for high income people, but then at the same time, you have to be like living super frugally and eating rice and beans, right? So there's definitely like those two things kind of go hand in hand. And the way that I look at fire is it's pretty agnostic to level of income. Yes, if you have a higher income, maybe it'll be easier for you, but it doesn't necessarily mean that if you have a lower income that there's no way to improve your finances, right? I think of FIRE as this general model of increasing your income, decreasing your expenses, and investing the gap. So 
really what's important, more important than your income or expenses is the gap. And you can increase that gap by increasing your income or reducing your expenses or ideally both. I think we get this misconception about the frugality because most of the loudest voices in the movement are talking about frugality. They're talking about reducing consumption. And a lot of times reducing expense expenses is like the easiest thing to do when you're first starting out. Increasing your income can say, take some time, but you should be doing both, right? I, in an ideal situation. And then when it comes to, you know, it's only for people with a really high income. Again, naturally, if you have a high income, this is going to be easier. But I meet people all the time. I'm sure you do too. People making less than six figures that are figuring this out just because they're they're very focused on making sure that they're they're living within their means and they're keeping their expenses very low. Um, so so yeah, it's there's this real dichotomy of like the the misconceptions that you hear. And then the people that you meet at places like economy and choose Fi, and I'm sure you guys in your, your community as well. Um, th those two things just aren't lining up. I always found that very offensive. The, the statement, well, this is only for people that, that make, you know, high incomes it, because it's like automatically assuming that someone's income is static. Like you have no control or no agency over increasing your income. You only make 20, your entire future is bound up in your $20,000 a year career. I'm sorry. There's nothing you can do about that. There's no actions that you can take that could possibly change anything. Just sit over there and try not to look around because it's not for you. That's basically what I, that's the, that when I get angry, actually angry at yeah. this kind of straw man that is created <laughs> because someone's saying, this isn't for you. You couldn't possibly do any better. Don't, 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 don't look over here. What? Yeah. When we have absolute proof of people that have switched careers and like, Three months, four months, and are making, you know, they were making $15 an hour. And now, without going back to college, now they're making seventy dollars to $80,000 a year. I mean, you know how passionate I get about this. This is like, it doesn't mean you just need to show someone how they can get to a 50% savings rate if they're making $15 an hour. You could build a strategy that's equally around helping someone go from $15 an hour to seventy k a year and do it in three or four months with a very predictable approach. Then what? Absolutely. You know, it's, yeah. it's math, people. I think this flavor of financial literacy appealed to me based on the optimism around it. There's a lot of content out there that's like general personal finance content that tap, and I read it every day on my podcast, right? On, on Optimal Finance Daily, I'm narrating blog posts from for personal finance bloggers. And a lot of time the content will be, this is going to be hard. This is going to be a struggle. Money matters are really difficult. And what I really was attracted to in the fire content was this idea of optimism that, that actually it's within your control, that you have control in reducing your expenses and increasing your income. Um, yeah. I'm going to steal that from you because you got me even one of my earliest memories, just that unbridled optimism was Mr. Money Mustache, you know, going back to 2012. I think that's one of the things that clicked with me exactly what you just said. I remember reading that and my mentality shifting to, oh, I got this. You know, that was, mm -hmm. I can yeah. do this. Right. Um, I think it helped me realize how much I was wasting my privilege, frankly, because a lot of us are in pretty privileged positions. We're in a first world country. We have access to internet. We have roofs over our heads and foods in our bellies. Right. So, you know, I think I had this mentality of, well, if only my employer paid me more, then I'd be able to get ahead. And I wasn't really being honest with how wasteful I was being with my spending. And I cannot possibly be the only one. So coming across this fire content really helped me realize how much was actually in my control. And it was really empowering. Yeah, I totally agree about the, the optimism and that internal locus of control, right? Like that truly is to me, that is the heart of financial independence, right? There's nothing like, like we were talking about before the show, there's no card carrying member. There's nothing you, there's no test you have to take to be a member of this community. For me, it's about, you have to take action to make your life better. And you can take these tiny, tiny little actions that all compound onto each other and you start seeing success and it starts snowballing, right? And again, when you realize that you can affect change on your life, that there's not some elusive they that you always mm -hmm. hear about, right? They, they impact me, right? Like, no, you impact you. 
right? Right. No matter what your situation to both of your points, there's, there's an equation here. You can earn more as Jonathan's talking about with entrepreneurship, you can spend less, right? Any of these aspects, you can grow that gap and you have control as opposed to you hear so many horror stories in, you know, from the Susie Ormans of the world of, oh, you couldn't possibly retire, right? You need five, 10, $20 million. How could you ever retire? Well, that's hopeless. Yeah. I don't want to live like that, right? I want to live with, okay, this is within my control. And what really matters is, hey, what does my life cost every year? I need to eventually cover that. And I can do that a variety of different ways. I think right. that's fantastic. Yeah. And I think what's really feeding a lot of these misconceptions is, again, the bloggers that are most popular who are telling their personal story around something that they identify with, with which is the fire movement. It looks like their personal interpretation that of, of fire are like the rules that you need to follow. If it's a certain savings rate or the way that these people invest or the way they reduce their expenses. I know I fell into that for a while. I wanted to be like the female version of Mr. Money Mustache. It took me a while to kind of come up with my own flavor of fi to, to come up with like, what, what are my own financial goals? And to recognize, like, I don't want to ride a bike. You know, I don't want to do a lot of the stuff that Mr. Money Mustache does. And I don't want to be him. I want to be me. And I, I think each person has a really unique set of unique skills, preferences, um, and, you know, interests that are going to drive their unique path to FI. Don't try to copy someone else because I think if you get stuck in that game, you're like robbing yourself of the ability to write your own story. And there's a lot of joy that comes in that. So like, for example, you know, my path to FI, I think I started out, you know, trying to copy other people and, and do what they were doing. And I had in my head, you know, I am going to reach 25 times my yearly expenses. I was on trajectory to meet that by the time I'm 40 years old. So I'm like six years away. And you know, then I will quit my W2 job. Well, life presented some other options to me and my work situation changed. I started my own business. I got side hustles that are taking, you know, a lot of my time. And I decided, you know what, I'm going to take a break and walk away from my salary and pursue self-employment for the next year. That was not in my original plan, but having this like bandwidth of, you know, financial stability allowed me to start like asking bigger questions of what do I want to do with my time and what do I want to create versus, you know, how do I just keep reducing my expenses and increasing my income until I reach this magic number? You know, I'm, I'm kind of, I feel like kind of slowing down on my path to five to, to not be racing to meet this number, to kind of using this time to really explore what I want to do. I kind of think about things in life in terms of, you know, five and 10 year timelines, that sort of thing. And I guess I would just ask like each of you 10 years ago, did you have any idea that you would be where you are today? So Diana, I'll pose that to you first. Like, yeah. could you have predicted that you'd be sitting here having this conversation in the context of what your life actually looks like 10 years ago? Absolutely not. Yeah. And Brad, Brad to you, I mean, does your life now, the framework for your life, does it look like what you envisualized for yourself 10 years ago? No, I could have never imagined that I would be a podcaster, right? <laughs> Just that in and of itself seems, seems ludicrous. So, I mean, 10 years ago in yeah, 2011, I had never started an online business. I was just an accountant. I was a mid-level manager doing corporate state tax returns and you know, which is crazy. It's hard to believe how far I've come, but, but it's not just that it's not like, and this goes to Diana's point of like the misconceptions about it just being a path, right? Like one yeah. particular path. I think it's so much larger than that. As, as Diana, you were just saying, like this gives you the space to explore. It gives you the space to explore what you want your life to look like what you want to focus on, right? This is what we've always said at Choose of I is the nuts and bolts of the money. It's really pretty easy once you figure it out. I'm not saying it's, it's easy to get out of debt or, you know, get to FI, right? But the actual nuts and bolts of money, it's pretty easy to figure out. But, but happiness, right? What do you want to spend the next 60 years of your life on? Those are the hard questions. And that's what we've been focusing on much more. And I know in my own life, that's what I've been focusing on. That's what the last 10 years have been. This has been 
an exploration. And believe me, I'm very much still a work in progress. But, you know, I'm, I've been able to focus on that. I think that to me is the biggest blessing that comes from this path to five. The space to explore was a phrase you used there, Brad, that, that I think is really important for people. The, the financial independence community gives you the space to explore, gives you some safe guardrails to allow, to allow you to just kind of see what is it you want to do with your best years, not just your golden years. Like, is there a general loose framework that we can get on and say, okay, now look around, what do we want to do? And so 10 years ago, I was in pharmacy school. Basically my future was being set by the institutions uh, to which I had decided to, you know, study to become a pharmacist. And, and, and because of that, I'd taken on nearly six figures student loan debt. Like my entire future was written out by the college institutions and the student loan debt that I had taken on. All right, you're going to go into this professional career. It, in 2012 was when I really stumbled on to the financial independence community. It gave me the space to uh, explore this. Now, I still had six figures of student loan debt, you know, and I still was pretty you know, head deep inside of this, this professional career track that I was on, but I started looking around. And so long before reaching even debt-free, long before reaching 25X, because I was exploring what is possible when you have the basics of these principles under control, I started to then be able to, to see opportunities, right? And I could see how, if I could just go down this path, even a little ways, I would be able to get more of those. And at some point, I would be able to do leverage FU money. We talked about affectionately how, you know, and Diana, our story is actually kind of similar in that before reaching financial independence, I was able to walk away and explore really some interest-led learning and turn that into an, an, an income stream. And that's actually really important to people. If the goal was just to make more money, like the career track you were on gave you a path to do that. In fact, you would be at financial independence potentially sooner just by throwing yourself at work but you made a choice to potentially make less money, which I think goes to one of these yeah. myths and misconceptions ideas. Let's explore that a little bit. Yeah. I mean, again, if it's all about just making more money, I mean, I can think of so many people that have more money than me or make more money than me, and they don't necessarily feel the emotional benefits from that right? I think what I've learned about money from this whole process is that money is only as valuable as your clarity on how you're going to use it and your comfort level on how much is enough. And if you don't have those two aspects around your money, then it doesn't matter how much you have. And I think this pursuit of fire has really, um, allowed me to, to ask those kind of questions of myself, the role that money plays in my life, the leverage that it gives me, the options that it opens up, even though I'm not financially independent. You know, when my work situation changed, I ended up, you know, it turned into a pretty toxic environment over the last year. And before that, you know, I was with this company for nine years. I thought I'm just going to stay here until I reach FI. And I, you know, was really just seeing things degrade. And I looked at my finances and realized, first of all, I'm coast fi. So if I didn't contribute one more dollar to my retirement vehicles, it's what I'm going to need for traditional retirement in 30 years. So that's a great milestone that opens up some options and takes some pressure off of savings. And then I have FU money, which I define as two years of living expenses liquid. That to me is like, great. I've got my finances in a pretty good spot. I'm actually in a place where I can take some educated risks and I can take a big bet on myself over the next year and, and look at self-employment. Now, maybe I'll make more money than I did when I had a W2 job. Maybe I'll make less. I'm not sure. But just that being able to tolerate that uncertainty is due to the financial stability that I've built over the last five years. Oh, I love that, Diana. So the intersection of educated risks and Coast Fi. Right. Let's let's talk a little bit more about this just for anybody listening to this who doesn't really understand that concept of Coast Five. But as I'm understanding your explanation of this, so you have saved up a significant amount of money and that money will grow invested. And you basically now just need to cover your yearly expenses. So let's say you were making a previously much higher salary, obviously, and you had a significant mm -hmm. savings rate. But right. now if you can just cover your annual expenses, it gives you that ability to take these educated risks, right? So right. you can make dramatically less, cover your expenses all the while 
your investments are growing, right? That is, is that the concept of Coast Five that you're describing? Absolutely. And by kind of taking my foot off the gas a little bit and coasting, I mean, I, maybe that's where the term comes from. Um, my life is looking right now a lot like I would want it to if I was actually financially independent and retired. Because I'm not, here's another misconception. If you're retired, it means that you're not working and you're sitting around doing nothing. That's, I think, a big misconception. Most people that I know that are pursuing fire are going to be fairly ambitious people and not satisfied with sitting around and doing nothing. You know, you're going to be entertained by sitting on a beach for like maybe three months and then you got to do something with your time. So I do think that there are people out there where maybe they're making money in their early retirement, which I think it's really hard to avoid it if you're doing the things that you want to do. Right. But at the same time, like a lot of us that are working in this space, it probably looks like we're making money off of our passion projects. But I'll tell you right now, I'm not making any money off of economy. It probably looks like I am, but I'm sure not. You know, so I, I think we got to be careful on looking at people's businesses. You don't know what their costs are. You have no idea what their profit margins are and, you know, if they're actually living off of those businesses. But yeah, I think we're kind of need to, to change the definition of like what retirement actually is, because I'm not sure for anyone, regardless of your age, it should look like sitting around and doing nothing. And Diane, I think part of the issue is actually just the word retirement. Yeah. We've got like, a branding problem for sure. Isn't that your background as really, the branding really. and marketing, Diana? <laughs> yeah, I haven't found it. I haven't found a solution yet. <laughs> oh, it's so hard. I mean, this is why we talk about Phi, right? For us, yeah. it's yeah. 99% of the time, it's just Phi because that's what this is about. It's about the financial independence. It's about then the options that open up to you to take those educated risks, right? So yeah, I, I, I think for me, I just, I cringe inside every time I hear retirement or retire early in reference to any of this. It's just, it's optionality. Right. Yeah. I mean, the retirement piece is one of many options, you know, and I think it means different things to different people. I think like a lot of us, you know, we're very much focused on the FI part and then opening up the options to kind of figure out what we do from there. Yeah, it's funny. I, the the retirement word doesn't really have any appeal for me either. I don't think it would have any appeal for me at the age of 65 either, though. I mean, it's kind of like, you know, it's not really even like, it's just like, what does that mean? Like even people that are retired sometimes getting depre are depressed about retiring. Like it's yeah. not, it's not a word that's full of joy and hope and optimism. It's more like a word of escape. And I'm just trying to right. build something that I want to run to. Uh, it's not about anything, you know, it, the word retirement almost has the defeatist tone to it. I've got to retire from this. I can't do this anymore. It's like, no, check out what's on the other side. Check out what I'm running to. Uh, check out how I'm going to leverage my FBU money, my financial independence, see what I've built. And I just am choosing the better option, right? Like I've been building this right. awesome thing over here and this is what I'm going towards. So I don't have a better word, but that's my, that's, that's how I view it. I love this kind of mental shift that I saw the pioneers put this out on like a slow fi group that they run, um, on Facebook. And they said, don't ask yourself, what would you do if you could retire early? Ask yourself what you would do if you could never retire, because now you're not like waiting to do something later in life. That's kind of what happened to me in, in kind of a reverse way. So when I created economy, it was born out of me asking myself, what would I do if I no longer had to work for money? What would I want to do with my time? And I'd want to create a party about money. Like that's just what I wanted to do. I just got so excited about it that I couldn't wait. And I think that's what they're talking about. Like think when you think about the things you want to do when you're retired and I'm doing air quotes here, um, you know, is there a way that you can change around your life to do that now? Why wait? And there are so many examples of individuals that have made exactly that choice. Once you realize that you can and that your worst case scenario is just everyone else's every day, you can just go back. It's a turnstile. It's not a one-way street. It's a turnstile. It's what Joel from Phi 180 said, and, and it, was, it was really impactful on me. Your worst case scenario is just everyone else's every day. You can just go back. Yeah. So yeah. with that in mind, why would you wait to 65 to flex that power? Why would you just like, like, what could we do now? How could we like, what, what? infrastructure could we put in place over the next couple of years to give us some safety rails to go flex this FU money, to flex this power and see what we want to do with it. Whether that just means moving to a better job that you are afraid to ask for, you know, on day one, right out of college, 
or whether it means really doing what you you did, you yourself did, kind of flexing your entrepreneurial muscle and trying something. Alan Donegan very much likes the idea of just burning the boats and try it. I'm like a chicken entrepreneur. Like I, I like the idea of knowing that like my worst case scenario is just everyone else's every, uh, you know, every day. I'll just, I'll just don't go back. And I'm not going to put my family in financial jeopardy in order to do it. The other two aspects that I wanted to kind of talk about, because I think both of them really are hangups potentially for people is one, when they hear this idea of financial independence, wow, you're going to spend a lot of time thinking about money and growing your wealth. Like, isn't there some underlying level of greed that's involved with that? I mean, that that's one that I would love to hear you speak about. Like, is this just a community of Scrooge McDuck's? No. I mean, I think that financial independence puts you in a position to be really generous. And that's actually what I've seen um, from this community. I mean, even someone like me who like no one knew my name a year ago and, you know, I'm calling around to, you know, various speakers and heavy hitters that are big names in this movement. And like the fact that they even answered me and were generous with their time and believed in my dream of building this conference, like that just to me speaks to the generosity of this community. And I think when you have figured out money for yourself, there's like nothing else for you to do besides help, help other people, right? Like what else are you going to do with your time? And, um, I think that's a big reason why so many of us, you know, talk about this a lot. I found, I found it really interesting at the economy conference, even people that had already reached financial independence and retired, there was like 20% of the audience was over 50. And a big chunk of those were already retired. So why would they come to an event like this? You would think that this event is about helping people that are on the path or who want to learn about it. But I think the reason why they come is, first of all, because it's very fun, but also, <laughs> but also because they want to cheer us on. They want to share their knowledge. They, they see the freedom that it opened up in their life and they want to share that with other people. And so, no, I don't think it's about greed. Um, I heard someone say the other day that wealth is wasted on the wealthy, you know, people who have billions and billions of dollars that they're just sitting on. Like if you do have money, especially if you're financially independent, go out and create something go put something out in the world. That's the benefit of having money is to be able to share it in some capacity through what you create, through the gifts that you give. And I think this, this community I've seen is very generous in that regard. And I would also say they have one more asset that is uh, particularly in demand and, that, and that's time. Time is your most precious yeah. non-renewable resource. And most people that are just trying to make it from one paycheck to the next, they don't have a lot of it. They don't have a lot to offer. So when you have time and you have resources, it really, your, your ability to have impact is, is remarkable. Yeah. And Diana, I agree completely about it. It's really a rethink on, on how you relate to other people, right? Like it truly is that abundance mindset as opposed to a zero sum game of, I need to win. And in order for me to win, you need to lose, right? Like think about how often you see that in quote unquote real life, but I don't get that sense at all from the Phi community. I've, I've noticed the exact same thing as you, is that people bend over backwards to help each other. They want to feel like this is, they're part of something, right? They're part of something great. This is a community. They're always willing to give back with, with advice and mentorship. And I, I just find that so refreshing. Like it just, it makes me happy to be a, a part of humanity. Honestly, I know that sounds a little grandiose, but like there's, there's so many things we hear like this endless barrage of negativity. And I find the financial independence community endlessly hopeful. And yeah. it's, it's just a wonderful thing, right? Absolutely. I mean, I, I love this quote. Um, it says, if you look at your inner circle and you're not inspired, then you don't have a circle, you have a cage. And I love that because I think of all the people that I've met since I've joined the fire movement, joined this cult, right? And even creating the economy conference, some of my best friends today are people who were, you know, who I met through this process of building this business. And I just, I wouldn't have it any other way. I mean, I'm incredibly inspired that the, by the people that I'm surrounded with. And when I come up with my crazy ideas, I, now when I go to my friends, they're not saying here are all the reasons why you can't do that. They're like, oh, you can and you will and we'll help you. 
that's the response that I'm met with now. And I really do think the people that you surround yourself with has a huge effect on your quality of life. And, you know, I, when I think about like your three most important resources, money is one of them. Time is one of them. And you mentioned that Jonathan. Um, I also think it's your energy and people that you surround yourself with have a huge effect on your energy. And that's why it's so important that you're careful about who you surround yourself with and these opportunities to create community with like-minded people. Um, you know, let's not pass them up. It's interesting. I know that your, your community and some of the energy is, uh, includes JD Roth. Uh, from Get Rich Slowly. He's a huge supporter and fan of what you're doing. I know he's been really helpful uh, behind the scenes with the economy as well. And uh, me and him have kind of gone back and forth over the last years about whether or not financial independence, whether or not financial independence is a fad. It's a fad. And JD makes mm. the case that in the early 1990s, Vicky Robin, it, it had a time. And, you know, we saw this zeitgeist moment in the early 1990s and then kind of the attention waned away. And then we saw, a, you know, a similar kind of peak in 2012. And then it's kind of been going at a certain level. And he stated about a year or two back that we had hit his words, quote unquote, peak fire, peak fire. And that, uh, and I pushed back on that. And I was like, people always want more options. And I would kind of yeah. give some reasons why things are different now than they were in the 1990s. And part of that being the fact that people had, there was more democracy in terms of being able to share ideas. Uh, the platforms that are available, social media that was available. You know, I gave a bunch of reasons for why I thought that this was not the case, but I'd be curious about your take. This idea of getting financial independence in your peak years, you know, much earlier in life, this idea of maybe not get rich quick, but get rich quick-ish. Are we in fact dealing with the fad that everybody will have moved on from in exchange for the next thing, you know, maybe next year? I don't think so. I don't, I think that you know, money is a resource, right? Just like any other resource, like our energy and time, like I just said, right? And so I think we're always going to be fascinated with how do we optimize our resources because we recognize that that affects our quality of life. I don't see that ever going away. This idea that like maybe fire is a fad, I mean, we already kind of reviewed that fire isn't for one segment of people. You know, fire is more about financial literacy with enthusiasm, right? It's, it's not a specific investment strategy. It's, it's not one path, right? It's, it's every, everybody has a, their personal take on it. So to me, what fire is, is much more like an identification with something to build habits to meet your goals. So like, if you want to run a marathon, if you need to identify as a runner and you need to surround yourself with other people who identify with runners, that is going to make you more likely to reach, reach your goal of running a marathon. And that's the way I look at fire. We are all decided that we want to run a marathon. Is that ever going to go away? Are people just going to decide one day that they no longer want to run marathons? I don't know. I, I, I don't think so. I think it's going to be something that's around for a while. And so we have created an identity around it and a support system around it. That's really kind of in its simplest terms, the way that I look at the movement. Yeah, this is all very interesting. I, I read a bunch of JD's articles about this and, and he said here in one talk recently, I claim that we've reached peak fire, as Jonathan said, and I stand by that. But I, while I think we're at or near peak popularity for this subject, I do not think financial independence is a fad. In fact, I know it's not. And yeah, I, I would actually even push back on the, the peak popularity. I would disagree. And especially Diana, how you're describing it is almost verbatim how I conceptualize the FI movement. This is such a broad tent. And I don't think any of these things are going to change, right? Like people, again, wanting control over their life, people thinking long-term, people living below their means, whatever, whatever that means to them, right? Like people wanting to spend time in a community of like-minded people. Like I, I don't find these as fad like in any sense. I can't fathom that this is going to change. And, and I guess my, my pushback is I think what we're all doing here is normalizing this conversation, right? Yeah. We're normalizing the concept of phi. And whereas, as we talked about earlier in the conversation, this used to seem cult-like or it used to seem like you needed to be a certain person or make a certain income. Now it's anybody can take actions to make their life better. Right. And when they see other people around them, it's not just one person in a town who's an island unto, unto themselves. Right. Now we have 
local groups where you can meet up with people in real life. You see it and you see other people taking action to make their own lives better. And then you want to tell your friends about it. It's not, you're not the weirdo anymore. It's, hey, we've got a thousand people just here in Richmond, Virginia that identify as part of our group, right? Hey, come out to this meetup, see what people are doing. Like you can, it's much more normal as opposed to when I got into this, who could I talk to about it? Right. Yeah. So I think that to me, I, I agree 100% with JD that it's, uh, it's definitely not a fad, but yeah, I mean, I think there's, there's growth potential for what we think is just a very normal lifestyle. I don't think there's anything unusual here. Yeah. I'd love to actually circle back, circle back. Uh, we got this, you know, I got a new year incoming here and we're going to probably see uh, conferences start to pick back up. And I'm very excited to know that economy is currently on the books and I would very much be interested both for myself and for people listening. What plans do you have this year? Maybe changes? Uh, what would people expect if they show up for an economy event? And then most importantly, where can they get more information? Absolutely. So the economy conference is scheduled for March, not March. We're in March. March <laughs> was last year when the economy conference happened. It is November 13th and 14th of this year at the university of Cincinnati. Um, you can find more information at economyconference.com, and that's economy with an M E at the end and not an M Y because I'm so clever. Uh, economy. <laughs> but that's where me. Me. Yes. It's kind all about me, you. Me. <laughs> right. But we're not selfish and greedy with our money, right? <laughs> and so, yes, economyconference.com, you can see some of the speakers that I've announced thus far. Um, we talked a lot about JD Roth today. He is helping me a lot on the economy conference, uh, attracting the speaker lineup and sponsors. And so he is going to be joining me there. Um, we've also got Joe Saul Seahigh with Stacking Benjamins. And fun thing with Joe, he's actually um, going to be having a live taping of his show. We're going to rent out a comedy club and on Friday night, that's kind of a new thing for the conference as a part of our programming. We didn't have anything last year for people on Friday night, but you can go hang out with Joe at a comedy club for a live taping. Uh, you got him out of the basement. That's right. Got him out of the basement. Um, we've also got speakers like Nasima McElroy. We've got bitches get riches, which I'm not sure if I can curse on your podcast, but that's what they're Wait, called. Does their name have a curse word in it? <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you can, you can read about all the, the different, um, speakers on the website and sign up for my newsletter as I'm announcing more. I think big changes this year. I heard the audience loud and clear that they wanted more breakout sessions. So I've added more breakout sessions into the schedule. I think one of the best things about this event is yes, you can learn from these amazing speakers on the main stage, but then we really facilitate learning from each other. So we do these breakout sessions that, um, yes, they will be facilitators, but they're more facilitating a discussion with the other guests. Um, We'll have a, a, a really great after party like we did last year. And then the next day, Sunday, we will have a number of post event activities so that you can t continue to build these friendships. So we'll be doing an urban hike around Cincinnati, which to me, Cincinnati is the best city to pursue financial independence. It is one of the lowest cost of living um, areas in the country. And I moved here from New York City. So I, I came from a big city and I absolutely love it here. So take my word for it. But we will show you all the great things around Cincinnati. We're also really well known for um, craft breweries. So we'll be doing a brewery tour and potentially a cooking class, still working out um, some of the activities for Sunday. But it's a two day event, um, you know, maybe two and a half days if you include Friday night. And if we are not able to gather in large groups by November because I know this is a huge concern for people. Tickets are on sale now and people are saying, well, let me wait and see. I don't know what's going on with COVID. Obviously, if it's unsafe to gather in a large group, we will not be gathering in a large group, but we're not canceling economy and we're not pivoting to a virtual event. We have backup dates for March 19th and 20th, 2022, and I will notify everyone by September 1st if we're pushing the event back to March. So I would advise you to buy your ticket now, but don't book your accommodations or flight until after September 1st so that, you know, we're confirmed if we're going to still have it in November or not. That's great, Diana. I love the the plans there. And it looks like you have uh, early bird tickets available through April 10th. 
That's right. That's right. They're 149 through April 10th. We've got 200 available at that price. And then after that, it jumps to 199. Awesome. Well, I hope everybody goes. Let's book those tickets. And it's excited to see these opportunities come back online. And then finally, for individuals, because I know you actually, as you mentioned earlier, are you have your own podcast that you're narrating and you're doing various articles. Tell our audience about where they can find you and what it is exactly that you're doing. Absolutely. So Optimal Finance Daily is actually a show that's been around for five years and they were looking for a new host that was before they were using a voice actor because it's a narration style podcast. So what I'm doing is I'm reading you a blog post from a variety of different contributors every single day of the year in 10 minutes or less. And then I'm offering my own commentary on it. So it's been really fun for me because I'm learning a lot from the articles that I'm reading. And I like to think of it as these bloggers like wrote these amazing songs and I get to perform the covers. That's kind of how I look at it. So it's very fun. I invite you to subscribe to Optimal Finance Daily and allow me to serenade you with the sweet sounds of personal finance knowledge. (laughs) Awesome. Fantastic. (laughs) That's great. All right, Diana, best wishes this year with the Economy Conference. It's going to be amazing. And um, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. Thank you. All right. That's going to bring this episode to a close. You know, if you're listening to this episode for the first time and you've, you've kind of worked through those myths and misconceptions and like me, you say, yeah, there's really no downside to being on the path to financial independence. How do I get started? Let me encourage you go to choosefi.com slash start. We've put all of our resources there for you to make it very easy to get on your own path to financial independence very, very quickly. All right, my friends, the fire is spreading. We'll see you next time as we continue to go down the road less traveled.